thanks for taking the time, man. A lot of uh, demand to get you uh, on the show. I think like every single day I get an email, like when are you going to have Durian Ryder on the, on, the, on the podcast? So by popular demand. And the funny thing too is I feel like uh, every... Um, like every other uh, guest I've had on the show, it seems like lately has been uh, has been uh, Aussie. So you're continuing the uh, the trend. <clears throat> I wanted to bring you on, and I just I want you to uh, spin your yarn, man. Don't pull any punches. No no uh, no rules. Nothing is uh, out of bounds. I just want I want to hear it straight from the source. Cool. And uh, you know I've been I've been following you for a long time. I can't say I've watched every single uh, video, but I've watched quite a few and. Uh, and you're you're an outspoken bloke, and you're not afraid to speak your mind. And uh, I respect that, man. I appreciate that. We have different styles and how we approach things, but uh, there's a need for guys like you. But yeah, man, I wanted to kind of uh, you know peel back the layers a little bit. I mean, we want to talk about all the all the stuff that you're passionate about. But I think I wanted to start with talking a little bit more in depth about something that maybe you don't talk as much about, which is how this whole thing started for you. Like what was going on? I mean, I know you were a very different guy when you were younger in terms of your diet and your, your fitness and what you were into and all that kind of stuff. But how did it, how did it all begin? Like, you know, tell me about what your health was like before you started this journey. I think as a kid, I was always sick. I'd go to hospital for digestive and breathing issues like asthma and Crohn's disease. And so when you're sick, you just you want to feel good, you know, and then you get the days where you feel good, but it never lasted. So I just became obsessed about trying to pinpoint, connect the dots of what made me feel good and what made me feel bad. And it took me, I think, till I was probably maybe 1996, something like that, 98, 98, where I actually started to make the connection between diet, what you eat and how you feel. Before that, it was just mm-hmm. like, genetics or bad luck or some virus or some gastro thing getting around but it never occurred to me I think it's about 96 98 those two years um, I remember getting a voucher for McDonald's and eating a lot of burgers and just telling my friend one time I don't feel so good and I think I said I think it might be the burgers and she said do you really think what you eat determines how you feel and I'm like maybe I reckon maybe it does. <laughs> and we laugh now. But it's a radical concept. That's how I'm I mean, Crohn's disease is no joke, man. Yeah. Yeah. I, was, right, I, was, I mean, you know, Crohn's disease is a serious deal. Like, t- you know, talk a little bit about what, what it's like to have Crohn's disease. Yeah, just, you know, just you got to have a bathroom nearby. You're crapping blood and it, it just a lot of pain. Didn't you know, I didn't have a good time. But I didn't really talk about it too much because as a kid or a teenager, you sort of been embarrassed about it, stuff like that. So you kept it pretty private. Yeah, it's it's definitely something that people. I mean, I think now people talk about it more. But when I was younger, no one really talked about yeah. it because yeah, it's like embarrassing and all that kind of thing. I mean, what were the doctors telling you when you would go in for you know s- stuff revolving around having Crohn's? They just said to my mum that I was making stuff up and things like that. The asthma, they could tell I had the asthma and stuff, so they gave me heaps of you know, steroidal medication, things like that. But the digestive system was often I'd, I wouldn't go in anyway because I was too embarrassed to talk about it. But mm-hmm. occasionally when I did go in, they did x-rays and stuff and got me to consume this uh, radioactive stuff. And they just said, oh, we, we can't find anything, Miss Johnson. I think your son's got a bit of imagination going on. Oh, so they didn't even believe that you had it. Correct. Wow. So how did you finally figure out that that's what you had? I mean, you, you couldn't have self-diagnosed yourself with Crohn's at that age, did you? Or, or no, how no, did you finally no figure idea. out that that's what was going on? That was, only, that was only when I basically got over it that I worked out, well, that's, what, that's what's happening. Because I looked at the symptoms and I was like, okay, that's my symptoms, blah, blah, blah. And then a few other doctors um, later in my adult years said, yeah, you've got some digestive issues, stuff like that. Mm-hmm. Um, I started to clean up my diet a little bit and symptoms got a lot better and then I started doing sport sport definitely helped a lot but it still wasn't perfect and then once I went vegan like everything everything just lifted and I was like whoa this is how I'm meant to feel but what what motivated you to try a vegan diet like what was the impetus for that I had chronic fatigue you know I just I started getting into cycling started getting the sport and I'd go train I'd be all excited I wouldn't do much training but I'd just get burnt out I'd just be so fatigued I just couldn't get out of bed and I was like what's going on and so I'd have to take time off a few months off riding and stuff and then met this guy one day, this real sort of naturopath, herbal sort of health freak, Mark Hock, and uh, he just said, just try a vegan vegetarian diet. And I'm like, what the hell is that? Mm-hmm. 
I don't want to be a hippie. And he just said, well, you're pretty sick, mate, and you're only young, so if you keep going on what you're doing, you're going to get cancer, heart disease, type 2 diabetes, mate. So, you know, I don't care how fit you might think you are, but if you keep eating the crap you're eating, you're going to get sick. And I said, mm-hmm. well, to be honest, I'm pretty sick right now, Mark, and I'll try anything. And after a couple of days, that was it. That was no turning back, and I've been vegan ever since. Right. Yeah, I mean, I had a, I, I mean, I don't think, I wasn't as sick as you, and I was certainly older, but... What I remember <clears throat> about making the switch was just how dramatic it was in such a short period of time. You know, it didn't take very long for the body to respond. And that's like, it's like a watershed moment where you you connect the dots all of a sudden on something you never really thought about before, like that connection between what you're putting in your body and how it's making you feel. Mm. It was powerful. Right? It was powerful. Yeah. <laughs> right, right, right. I mean, when I started, I don't know what it was like for you, but I didn't know what I was doing. You know, I just tried it almost on a whim. It wasn't like I read a bunch of books or all the books that are out now. It was, uh, it was almost, you know, accidental. I didn't even have anyone telling me you should try a vegan diet. I just sort of experimented with it and was like, whoa, there's something going on here. Definitely, definitely. And there was a lot of defining moments, a lot of people who contributed and sort of little seeds got planted people would say stuff about what's in mcdonald's burgers what's in meats pies and you know how meat doesn't digest in your colon just sits there for years or whatever just little seeds of truth that i heard that eventually just became a full-grown root in my consciousness and just it took hold and grew Uh uh-huh so so will you have this experience where you suddenly start to feel better i mean were you overweight then or no no, i wasn't overweight so you, yeah, 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 but you weren't you weren't that athletic then. I was wanting to be. I was always as a kid. I was always wanted to be one of those fit kids. I always get picked last on a sports day, and a lot of my friends from school now they can't believe how fit I am. They're like, "Hang on, hang on, no, you, you're Harley from school. Like you, you're, you're the guy who got picked last on sports day. You're the guy who all the girls ran faster than. You're the guy who couldn't catch the ball or whatever. Uh-huh. What are you doing now? You're running marathons. You're winning running races. What? Well, how does that work? So right. I was, always wanted to be athletic. I really admired. I'd watch the Nike adverts on TV. You know, the, there is no finish line, stuff like that. And I'd always want to be like the kids riding the bikes around and, and be strong and stuff and have fitness and energy. I just wanted to have energy, but I never had it. Mm-hmm. And then so suddenly, so now that you have this sort of new lease on life by changing your diet this way, so I guess you're saying that, that that's what gave you the the energy or the the resurgence of vitality in order to kind of then pursue that definitely I, I think that's why i'm so evangelical and so passionate and so persistent and nagging because i've felt so crap and i feel so good now and i want everyone to feel how good i feel right right and so then how is it uh how has it evolved since that first kind of experience i mean because you've continued to experiment and play around with different things to kind of where the where where you're at right now which i want to get into in a minute just sort of stumbled into raw foods, eating more fruit, understanding that fruit was actually a good option rather than just a snack. The concept of having fruit for a meal uh, versus just a snack after a meal, that was definitely life-changing as well. Um, and just talking about getting more about, learning about low fat and how many grams of carbs to eat and how to be properly hydrated, when to eat, you know, things like that, mm-hmm. sleeping patterns. Were you like reading a bunch of books then or just sort oh, yeah. of experimenting on yourself? Both, just Are, reading, 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 talking, right. emailing, mm-hmm. nagging So what were, some, what were some of the books that you were reading that you found helpful? One of the first ones, my friend Paul Reed gave me a copy of Fit for Life by Harvey Diamond. Mm-hmm. And that was a real, uh, very good book to start with for me. Talked about eating fruit for breakfast and lunch. And I started, I started doing that. Boom, just felt great. Then got a book about raw food by Paul Nixon. In that book, it was a pretty confusing book because it talked about breatharianism and stuff like that. But And they had an <laughs> interview with Doug Graham in there. And I was like, wow, of all the interviewers, all the interviewees that Paul Nixon has interviewed, this Doug Graham guy, he's the only fit-looking person in the whole book. Everyone else looks like crap. Looks like they couldn't run around a block. Surely mm-hmm. nice people, but I wanted I wanted energy. So I'm like, hey, this thick guy, he, he looks like he's got some energy. And... Uh, so I just started doing some Google searching on Doug Graham and read some of his blogs and internet posts and then eventually started getting an email contact with Doug and went from there. So was that before his 801010 book came out? Or? That was 2002. Right. And 2002 is when you first got in touch with him? Or I can't remember when his book came out. I know it's been out a little while. 2002, I got in contact with him briefly. 2003, I bought his... Uh, 
No, actually, 2002, I bought his books, Creating Health Program, stuff like that. He's uh, How Much Fruit's Too Much Fruit, CD. Basically, bought all, everything Doug had on sale at the time and just listened to it over and over and over again. I do like 200K bike rides, just listen to it, repetition, and then got into contact with Doug on email and he helped me out a lot for free as well. Very generous. Mm -hmm. And went from there and then... So it was pretty quick, like evolution from just sort of saying I'm a vegan to really getting on board with this, the high carbohydrate kind yeah. of sub subset of being vegan, right? Like that was, the, that was like a pretty quick process and, and, and you've never looked back. So it's been 10 years, 11 years now of doing this. Yeah. 12 years being vegan, 11 years into the high raw foods, vegan lifestyle. Right. And, uh, and, you know, you continue to excel athletically and win races and get faster. I mean, how old, how old are you now? 36. 36. It's a bit right? of a late so, bloomer. Uh -huh. Have you been, have you been racing this year? Uh, running races I have. Yeah. Uh huh. How's it going? Yeah, good. I, I set my be my best times last year. When I was doing a bit more training this year. I've been a bit lazy, but, um, uh -huh. last year definitely set my PBs from marathon to 5k to the mile. Right. Uh, still on about 10 miles a week. <laughs> average over the year uh-huh and quite a bit of cycling i mean i know like this past the lat was it last january when the strava the strava challenge happened and you logged more miles than anybody else on strava for that <laughs> how many how many k's did you end up riding that month uh 6,190 right. <laughs> and i mean for people that don't know strava is a sort of a, a, a social network an online community for it, it started for primarily for cyclists and I think it's still predominantly for cyclists but it's still it's open for running and, and other fitness related exercises but it's it's your way to kind of share your workout and you can see the map and see the data if you upload your stuff from your Garmin etc and uh, <clears throat> and it's pretty popular with professional cyclists like there's a lot of professional cyclists that are logging their rides on Strava and they love to mix it up on there as well. And January is the time of year when they're putting in a lot of base miles. So you're you're basically logging miles when there are guys on, you know, the Garmin team or, you know, Liquid Gas or whoever who are also, you know, doing it at the same time. So that's no small feat to be logging the kind of miles that somebody who's doing that for their profession is doing. Yeah, it was, it was a big ego challenge for me. I, I yeah. remember what I like about Strava is a big community. It's like Facebook for cyclists and runners, mm -hmm. and it's for everyone. It doesn't matter how fit or unfit you are or how fit you're getting. Strava's for everybody. I remember the training of Andy Schleck in January with the Radio Shack Trek team, and I met him in the city. And they're like, "Oh, you, you've been riding this morning. You know, you look like you're already sweaty." I said, "Yeah, I've done 100k already." They're like, "Hey, it's only eight o'clock." How did you do 100 uh -huh. k's? I got on the bike at four o'clock this morning. You know, wow. and they're like, "No way, no way!" Show me the Garmin. Show me the Garmin. And they're like, like Andy Schleck and Jens Voigt are just going bullshit. How are you riding so much, man? What's uh -huh. up with that? And they were tripping That's... out. Um, they were just all the teams were tripping out. And then they started talking about it because I was riding a bamboo bike, and they're like, "Is that crazy vegan guy on his bamboo bike? And he's doing more. <laughs> he's doing like 100 k's before he meets up with us, and then he does extra afterwards." And it was, it was a definitely a tough month. But it was good. So, who was the who was the runner up in that? Um, some guy from uh, Guadalupe, uh -huh. who, who was uh, it was a bit it was a bit of a controversy there. I, I was trash talking a lot of guys, <laughs> trying to get them fired. Oh, shocking, shocking man! <laughs> and uh, so so a few guys didn't want me to beat them, so they started doing manual entries. And a manual entry, for those who don't know, it's just you can just make up a number what you rode that day, but you don't have to GPS verify it. Right. So they're just saying, yeah, I rode 350 kilometers today or whatever, and just they're just trying to piss me off and overtake me. But in the end, I still I still won. And this year, I was speaking with Strava, some of the admin at Strava, and they said this year for the 2014 base mile challenge, we're going to have no manual entry, so it can only be legit GPS verified data if you want to be in contention again. So that's going to make right. it more fair. So you're going to hit it again. Yeah. And All then, right, man. Yeah. So. You know, I I want to get into like where you went from sort of experiencing this on a personal level, like this resurgence in vitality that we we're talking about, to be to stepping into this kind of not just an activist role, but you know, your self-proclaimed like health vigilante kind of status on the internet. Like, how did that blossom? Like, what was the beginning of that? And and you know, w w you know, I want to get kind of I want to pull the 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 veil back a little bit on like what motivates you and inspires you to kind of pursue your activism in this way? 
I just I'd meet people in real life and it was always a letdown you know they'd be like <laughs> they'd be writing books on health and they'd be smoking cigarettes or whatever it wouldn't make them bad people but like hang on how can you make say fruits bad but you're smoking cigarettes or you you're eating at McDonald's or whatever if you say fruits bad so I just wanted to like let their followers know that basically what you're getting taught isn't always correct. Mm -hmm. I mean, was there a day where, you know, you posted online for the first time or, you know, I mean, how did it kind of begin? I mean, when did you start your YouTube channel? June, 2008, I started it. Oh, it wasn't that long ago, actually. No. I, I, I thought it would have been back a little bit further. Yeah, freely. And other people said, you should do YouTube, you should do YouTube. And I'm like, oh, I don't want to get involved with that stuff. You know, I just want to be like fruit and hang out in the jungle. <laughs> Right. But then I realized, hang on, that's not going to help anybody. So I started uh -huh. on YouTube. But you, so, but you made this conscious decision that you wanted to help people. Yeah. Right? So what was, what was that about? That was just, did that grow just out of the frustration of, of seeing people professing something that you believed wasn't working or, or the confusion that was out there or the misinformation or, or what was it specifically? Yeah, both frustration on misinformation, frustration on people lying for marketing reasons, frustration on... Um, a lot of different levels, just seeing people getting ripped off. Um, right. And so, so you've come to this place now where, I mean, can you articulate like your basic message to people out there for somebody who might be listening, who, who isn't familiar with kind of the work that you've done? Basically, I promote a drug-free, 100% vegan, fruit-focused, high-carb, low-fat, vegan lifestyle, promote going to bed as early as you can, drinking your water, Focusing your life purpose, living that, and just being part of the solution versus part of the problem. Uh huh. So controversial, Harley. <laughs> I can't believe people are upset with you. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Come on, man. <sighs> Let loose a little bit. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like, I, <clears throat> I mean, when you watch, and I'll put this in the show notes too, and I'll do an introduction ahead of time, but you know, you have a really powerful, like your intro video on your YouTube page is just like, this is what I'm about. You know, there's a lot of BS out there. There's a lot of confusion. There's a lot of people with vested interest in having you believe that eating a certain way is good for you. And it's nonsense. And, you know, I'm here to set people straight. I'm not here to make friends. And, you know, you always provide the caveat, like, look, I'm sure they're good people, or I'm not saying somebody's a bad person, but I disagree with this person. And then you're very, very frank. You know, you're, you have the courage and the spine to be a lot more frank than most people are willing, willing to be. And you welcome the criticism because if you read the comments below your YouTube channel, like I'm a thin skinned guy, man. Like, I don't know if I can handle like people coming at me, like they come at you and you're just, you're wired for that. And, uh, and, and like I said, like, I respect that, but but I mean, how does that, does that bother you at all? Or are you just, I think you're just, you're a guy who just, you, you, and you, on some level, I, you're enjoying this, right? Yeah, definitely. You I have to be. Yeah. I wasn't wired for it though. I did stay up late one night and get a soldering iron out there and a, a TIG welder and, and wire myself up. I put on a bit of a battle wiring because I wanted to help people. And I realized that I can't help people if I'm taking it personally, what people say about me. I can't help people if I care more about what they think about me versus getting information to them. I can't help people if I'm being soft or taking it personally. I can't help people if I take things personally. So I just quickly got over that and thought, all right, this is the job. This is the goal. Nothing else matters. It's like riding a bike. You get a flat tire, you fix it, and you keep going. You crash, mm -hmm. you get on your bike, you keep going. You break a pedal, you get a spare, you keep going. And so I, I just keep focusing on my goal so it never, ever gets me down. If it starts to get me down a little bit, it means I need to get more sleep water sugar in. Simple as that. Right. I remember one time I did a bike race and afterwards this guy was talking to me he goes oh you got that guy from YouTube like what do you you know he started laying into me and I started to get a little bit offended I'm thinking hang on I never get offended and I'm like hang on I need some more water so I, I said wait I'll be back in a second mate so I grabbed a bottle of water smashed it down grabbed some dates smashed them down said alright I'll answer your questions and I was a different person within literally a minute of getting some water and sugar in different person so mm -hmm. I, didn't, I didn't take it personally. So I know that if I'm starting to take it personally, I need more sleep, water, sugar, or or, or three, <laughs> or th or three, right? So um, <clears throat> so so you begin to post these videos, and was there one video in particular that went more viral than the others, or you know, was there a moment where you thought, wow, I'm actually getting, you know, like when did the audience start to arrive? My first few videos, I got about five, ten, twenty views. And my channel was pretty dormant for about three years. 
And then I started doing videos critiquing like Daniel Vitalis, Dave Wolf, Susan Shank, etc. Just disagreeing with the information and just sharing my, my, my opinion. And that sparked a lot of controversy in the health food movement because in the health food world, they're like, hang on, don't judge people, just accept everything how it is. Even if it's mm-hmm. bad information, just accept it. And I'm like, well, that's, I, I disagree with that. And this is my opinion and I'm going to share it. I'm going to use YouTube and social media as a platform to share it with. And that went from there. Right. So um, did it begin with, with David Wolf? I mean, who was the first person that you kind of took to task? I think it was uh, the recently deceased uh, Aginus Wunderplanets. The, that's not his real name, but that's his that's his uh, author name. He was talking Who's about Aginus. Who is that? It's this guy who promotes eating uh, raw feces mixed on raw meat. True story. Like look it up. Primal diet. Uh, I've never even heard. I've never even heard of that. He's, he he was he died recently apparently from heart attack. Uh, he had a heart attack and fell off a roof in Thailand. Um, rest in peace. But so I did a critique on Aginus's book, and Aginus tried to sue me for that, claiming a copyright claim and stuff like that, and which I got that overturned. Um, and that was my sort of first taste and then I went after David Wolf and then he tried to sue me and then just, and then I was like hang on I'm getting sued for telling the truth I'm going to keep mm-hmm. I'm going to keep telling the truth then <laughs> and well as a lawyer I could tell you truth is the ultimate defense to you know any of those kind of claims right so I mean did you did you successfully get all of these claims dismissed or what what happened well I just realized that it was civil versus criminal and I talked to a few of my lawyer friends, they're like, yeah, there's nothing they can do, Harley. Like, it would cost so much money for them to try and do anything. This is just scare tactics, just, just you know, just waste their time and they'll give up. And they did. And uh, now I learned that... So are, were they actually, like, suing you or just sending you, like, cease and desist letters? Cease or, and desist, you know, that kind of and thing. I got one from Supreme Court of San Diego, um, from Dave Wolf and stuff like that. So, yeah. But uh, as, uh-huh. at the time, I was like, oh, my God, oh, my God. And then I realized, like, this is just scare tactics, nothing to be worried about. And now I actually... I enjoy when I get some legal paperwork because what I do is I I, re, I, I read it and then throw it in the recycling bin and then uh, send an email to that lawyer firm, whatever, and say, actually, I got the paperwork, but I lost it. Could you send out another copy? And I just keep doing that until it racks up, you know, a few hundred bucks, a few thousand bucks for the whoever's trying to sue me. And eventually they, they get the message <laughs> and they stop sending it out to me. All right, man. So, uh, I mean, we're in a situation, I don't know what the stats are in Australia, but in North America, um, you know, the, the health statistics are, are just appalling. You know, one out of every two Americans is likely to contract heart disease. One out of every three can suffer a heart attack. Childhood obesity rates are through the roof. By 2030, uh, I think 50% of Americans will be uh, diabetic or pre-diabetic, you know, 28 million people all over the world suffering from cancer. I mean, these are crazy, crazy statistics. And then we have all of these people professing this diet and that diet, and uh, this is this is how you're going to lose weight and blah, blah, blah. And there's a lot of confusion out there. And I think that the food companies or, you know, enjoy it that way because the more confusion there is, then the more likely people are to just keep doing what they're doing and saying, well, if these people can't even figure it out, then, you know, we're, we're going to remain golden. And, uh, <clears throat> and you've taken this sword and you're trying to cut a wide swath through all of this stuff. And there are all these, um, you know, I'm like conflicted because there's all these warring kind of factions within the health food world. You have the, you know, the, just to sort of state the obvious, you know, the low carb, high fat people, the paleo people, the Atkins people, you have the raw food people, you have the, the, you know, primal, you know, these, these tiny distinctions between paleo and primal, and then the raw milk people and, and, uh, and, and the vegan people who are doing it for ethical reasons versus the people that are doing it for health reasons. And then we have, <clears throat> you know, people like yourself and Michael Arnstein and Doug Graham who are, you know, succeeding and doing well with this 80-10-10 diet. And you're, you know, you're the third person I've had on the podcast. I had Michael Arnstein on and I had Mac Danzig on more recently who was talking about how he'd been, he's been doing it now probably four months, five months, and he was feeling great and, and, you know, couldn't say enough nice things about, you know, how great he was feeling and how he really believed that this was a good path for him. Um, and my conflict really is, you know, I'm focused on the people that are still eating McDonald's. And when we, when we go and we kind of go to the mat and we're fighting amongst ourselves, are we helping that guy or are we hurting that guy? And I'm not saying I have the answer. And, you know, my, I, I kind of come from a much softer place from you. 
than, than you do in terms of trying to bridge the gap. Whereas you come at it hard and you have this massive following of passionate people. So what you're doing is working. We're just, we're different. I think we have the same goals. I mean, is that accurate? Do you think that that's fair? hundred percent. I think, no, I don't think I know that there's different demographics out there and we need every single demographic represented. So we need people professional like yourself. We need clowns like me. We need everybody representing at some level that appeals to all the many dip- demographics and subcultures and races and religions out there. So I think it's everyone's doing their what they should be doing. I don't mm-hmm. think any anyone's style is right. I think maybe a, a style is right for that demographic, but not for every demographic. Right. So I think we yeah, all and need. It was like it was it was funny because when um, when my book came out, somebody emailed me and they said, "Oh yeah, you know, Durian Rider, he reviewed your book. You should check it out." They sent me a link, and I was like, oh, I had like a panic moment. I was afraid you were gonna like attack me, <laughs> you know. And you were very kind. And I appreciated the kind book, words that you said about my book. I, it meant a lot to me. Um, but I was like, I was like, Harley makes me nervous, man. I don't want to get on the wrong side of this guy. He's going to attack me, you know? No, that's a good book. As I did a big, I did a 200K ride on that book. I was like, you know, Finding Ultra sounds like a good book to, to listen to uh, mm-hmm. while I'm riding my bike on a big ride. So I did a 200K ride uh, June or July last year in the Gold Coast, Australia. And you're talking about this Springbook uh, facility you went to. And just as you said, Springbrook, I'm riding past the Springbrook sign to the Springbrook National Park. Uh-huh. That's crazy. Just as you said it, man. And I like, she yeah. was up my spine. I was like, yeah. And I was just, so I, I did an eight-hour ride that day, listened to most of the book, and then finished off the next day. And I was like, this is, this is good stuff. So I think I saw, um, well, thank you for that. Um, and that's cool. I like when little, the universe gives you little yeah. messages like that. Um, I saw one video. It was a while ago. I can't remember when it was, but you had mentioned that you were going to be that you were working on a book is that is that going on still going on and i think this book's definitely going to get me sued <laughs> because uh, uh, uh. the good thing about self-publishing a book is i can write whatever i want to write there's no youtube policing or facebook policing or instagram policing so this book's going to be it's going to ruffle a lot of feathers and i've got stories i'm going to put out there i'm just going to put it all out there in this book uh-huh can you tell me a story one of the stories just talking about uh I'm not sure what I can say, but uh, let me think. Let me think of a story that would be appropriate. All right, well, we can go back to it if you want. But I know, uh, I know, Michael Arnstein's working on a book too. Yeah, he is. So, uh, fruit is fruit is fast food. So yeah, it would be great to you know get your get your voice out there and and you know get it in writing and you know go beyond YouTube and uh, get something that people can put in their hands and, and read from your perspective because it's a, you have a very very powerful point of view, you know and. Uh, and it's reaching a lot of people, man, and you're doing a lot of good and you are ruffling feathers, but you know, it's, uh, you know, I think there's a big part of me that's like, you know, we need a revolution, you know, people are really sick and it's like, I've been traveling a lot lately. I'm in a lot of airports and you just see really unhealthy people and the line at the McDonald's in the airport is a mile long and there's no healthy options. And you just think like, what is going on? You know, we're just upside down on this whole thing. It's so easy now with social media, I'm trying to target the the young yeah, the young kids out there, the sub twenty or the sub twenty five year old girls and guys. That's my target audience now, because I feel that's the next generation coming through, and they're the most easy to influence because they want to look good, want to be slim and lean and or whatever. And unfortunately, that's why. And I think they they also have a lot. A lot of them have parents that are overweight or sick or or whatever, and they're seeing that, and they're like, I don't I don't want that. You know what what can I do to be different to not be suffering the way that my parents are. Especially the girls. I mean, most of my talks is a female audience because they're like, well, I want to get skinny. I want to get slim. Got, like freely. I want to lose the weight. Wait, what do I do? You know? And they, they're sick of the starving or the thyroid mm-hmm. drugs or whatever. And they just want to get slim and still feel sane. So that's, we used to focus right. on health. And health's good. <laughs> but unfortunately, people are more motivated by aesthetics than health today. And so I understand that. But the good thing is, our aesthetic message is is the best message for health as well. Right. So I can get totally down with 80, 10, 10, and I've talked to enough people that are, that are, you know, experiencing great results like yourself on it. So I have no problem with, you know, being on board with that as something that, <clears throat> that, uh, you know, that is advisable because I've just seen too many people that are thriving on it. Um, 
And, uh, you know, Michael Arnstein just can't say enough great things about it. And like I said, Mac Danzig, et cetera. But I will say, like I saw, so I've been, I watched a, a few videos and I, I've been watching the ones where now you're experimenting with all this processed sugar and you're pouring all this sugar on your, on your cereal. And then I'm like, yeah, I don't know about that. You know, so tell me what's going on with that, man. Come on. You're like, pour like half a bag of sugar on your cereal. Yeah, like half a pound or more. I just want to help people understand the concept. In the raw food world, it's like fruit's bad because fruit's got a lot of sugar in, in it. In the low-carb world or the, the standard American, standard Australian diet world, people are like, oh, fruit's bad because it's got a lot of sugar in it. I've been eating so much sugar from fruit for like over a decade. And I've got more blood tests, my hemoglobin A1C, my blood sugar levels, testosterone, all my thyroid. Everything's all perfect with no medications. So the fruit's good. And I'm lean as. And I don't do much training compared to guys. I have no, I have no problem. I have no yeah, I have no problem saying fruit's good, but let's can we can we create a distinction between fruit and the processed sugar that you're pouring on on your cereal, or are you saying that it doesn't matter? I say it doesn't matter, but fruit is obviously a better choice because it's got all, all your enzymes and nutrients and fiber with it. I want to help debunk the myth that sugar causes obesity or whatever, and by for, by pouring some sugar on some cereal in a YouTube video or in my smoothie, I can help create a little bit of a, a little bit of a wave there. But I honestly do consume that much sugar if I can't get enough sweet fruit. When I'm in Thailand and the US, the fruit's a lot sweeter there, so I don't really have to go to the sugar. But in Australia, if I'm a bit strapped for sugars from fruits, then I'll just smash in some organic processed sugar on some uh, on some fruit or some rice or some sort of low sodium cereal with a bit of organic rice milk or whatever. I have no issue with that at all. And I want to give people options so anyone can eat healthy, anyone can eat lean and clean foods. And obviously the, the sugar, processed sugar has got a very, very bad stigma. But I'm so sensitive. I can only eat really, really clean food. So if I can get away with that, then anyone can really. But the problem is that there are people, you know, drinking big gulps left and right or drinking, you know, 12, 12 Cokes a day. And, you know, and that's kind of like their go-to thing and these people are contracting diabetes all over the place right they're they're obese they're just on the the high fructose corn syrup like all day long and uh, i mean do you worry that when you sh put a video out like that that it will get misinterpreted oh definitely it's good cool. everything i do is going to get misinterpreted by someone but at least they're thinking about it and maybe create a bit of discussion like oh that durin rider guy he's crazy but it creates a bit of discussion if you look on any health form on the internet and type in durin rider i'm there the people are talking about it so I want to create discussion, but with the big, uh -huh. the big gulps and stuff, the issue, I haven't drunk a Coca-Cola since September 2000 when I was watching the Sydney Olympics. I believe Coke is poison. It's not because of the sugar, it's because of the frosturic acid and all the black stuff in there and the, the nasties in the Coke. I don't think it's the sugar. The sugar is fine, but it's what people have with the sugar. Generally, when people have a big gulp lemonade or whatever, they're having like ribs or chicken wings and all this fat with it. So they're putting all this fat in their bloodstream and they're having some, uh, some sugars and it's skyrocketing their blood sugar. But I've got some friends who are heroin addicts and they all just live on candy and like lollies, not chocolate, but just like lollies and uh, soft drink soda. And they're slim as. Obviously, they're uh, not healthy by any means. Right. I mean, <laughs> yeah, like, I don't know what you're, you know, like, but yeah, I don't know any, there there aren't very many overweight heroin addicts. No, but yeah, I, there's, I, there's some. But. There, you're right. There is some. I do, I have met some overweight meth and heroin addicts, and they're the ones who eat the sausages and stuff. My experience with drugs, I used to do a lot of drugs myself back in the day in the 90s. Most people do drugs, I've found out, for weight loss. Most people are addicted to meth and that because they want to get slimmer or coke and stuff like that. It makes you feel good, but then you start getting slim. You think, wow, I'm, I'm sort of looking a little bit better. That's probably another topic, but the the whole processed sugar is a non-issue. It's what people eat the sugar with. And I wouldn't drink coke because it's got all the phosphoric acid and all the nasties in there, but I'll pour organic sugar into my banana smoothie or organic coconut sugar in there, no worries. But if mm -hmm. you hand me a can of coke, I'd say well, no thanks. I mean, it's definitely controversial because you have on the other, you know, on the other side of this coin, you have this whole group of people and, and a group of people who kind of really have the microphone right now who are saying sugar's bad. Not only is sugar bad, all sugar is bad. And your body can't distinguish whether this sugar is <clears throat> coming from coming from fruit or processed sugar. It, it's, it all, can't. It's, it's all bad and you should not eat any fruit either and that this is evil like coming from the robert lustigs and the you know that kind of camp so your your response to that is what 
they, they are correct. Sugar is sugar, pretty much. Like my diabetic friends, when they have sugar from fruit or sugar from Coke or whatever, pretty much works the same. If you've got a little bit of fiber, it's a bit of a slow release, but it pretty much affects your blood sugar the same if you're eating a high-fat diet. But if people go on a Fruitera and an E1010 style diet, they reverse their type 2 diabetes in a few days or a few weeks. So they get to cut the fat out and the